There's just something special about Subnautica, no matter how many times you play it. I could go on for hours talking about all the things this game does right. Plus, it's still the best way to give somebody thalassophobia. Now, I've done no vehicle runs, no base runs, and toxic air runs. Not to mention the countless runs I haven't made videos of. But after beating the game so many times, it all seems a bit easy. So what if we wanted to make it harder? Sure, there's hardcore mode, but that barely changes anything about the actual gameplay. So how could we make the game both harder, but also more interesting? Well, the Subnautica modding community has answered that question, with a little mod called Death Run. When I did my last video with Toxic Air, I was playing without actually surfacing, but a couple of people mentioned that not being able to breathe on the surface is actually a feature of this mod. That, and countless other things that amp up the difficulty and drastically change how you play. So I decided to see if I could once again beat Subnautica, this time running the most difficult mod out there. Before starting the run, we're able to tweak a whole bunch of settings for the Death Run mod. In order to experience the brutal difficulty just as the creator intended, I left everything on the default Death Run setting. This affects quite a lot of things, including lots more damage taken, unbreathable surface air, radiation covering the entire ocean, a complex nitrogen diving system, limits on diving depth, a deadly aurora explosion, much faster power usage, a bunch of new item recipes, hugely increased crafting costs, blueprints requiring many more scans to learn, incredibly aggressive creatures with further sight range, a randomized start location, and many more things that aren't even listed here. With that big mess of potential issues in mind, I started off the run. Right off the bat, the life pod sunk to the seafloor and tilted onto its side. Of all the death run changes, I didn't find the life pod sinking to be that interesting. You're still close to the surface, and you can't breathe the air up there anyways. It's just slightly annoying trying to jump around to interact with the fabricator or the storage area. Once you repair it, the life pod rights itself, but stays around the same depth. Conveniently for me, my random start location ended up in the western safe shallows near the entrance to Jelly Shroom Cave. I actually like this spot a lot, close to tons of different biomes, while still being somewhat central on the map. Moving on to the actual gameplay, I immediately started off scrambling for resources and budgeting everything available. I needed to craft tools to progress, but I was losing hunger and thirst fast. All bases generate power extremely slowly in this mod, so each use of the fabricator had to be very carefully considered. Outside the life pod, I had to deal with the typical lack of oxygen and poor mobility in the early game. I couldn't just swim up for air, so I had to use that precious life pod power to craft an air pump and some tubes to head further out. Plus, there's this very punishing nitrogen system going on. As in real life, when you dive down, nitrogen builds up in your body. If you then ascend too fast, the nitrogen forms bubbles in your tissue, causing a whole bunch of potential problems. In this mod, it basically means you can't ascend too fast or you take a ton of damage. This is a constant annoyance, slowing down the game or reducing your time diving because you know you can't come back up quickly. And don't even get me started on the crash fish in this mod. There are tons of them, literally a handful in just about every cave in the safe shallows. The increased aggression means they'll target you much further away than normal, even through walls. Couple that with a huge increase to damage taken, and you're pretty much dead if they get close. After about 15 minutes of mostly survival with a tiny bit of progress, I received a notification that the aurora would explode in one hour. One hour, you're thinking. That's plenty of time. Well, it is in the base game, but it's certainly not in this. I knew from reading the mod page that the explosion would do two major things. One, instantly kill you if you're above 100 meters when it happens. 2. Fill the entire world with radiation down to 60 meters. Aside from the instant death that you could respawn from, the radiation is literally a run killer. If you don't have a radiation suit or a base below 60 meters, you'll be taking tons of damage every time you leave the life pod. Without medkits, you can't swim far at all because you'll die to radiation damage. Even with a medkit, your time and distance are severely limited. If I wasn't well prepared by the time the aurora exploded, I knew that I'd have to delete my save and start all over again. It's hard to tell from the footage, but I was definitely feeling the pressure at this point. I was scrambling as fast as possible to collect resources and carefully plan each use of the fabricator. The slow power generation on the life pod made that hour-long countdown very threatening. Coupled with the crazy material cost for important items, I had quite a lot of ground to cover. The habitat builder was my main goal, but that required materials from a handful of zones, including Jelly Shroom Cave. Normally you'd easily be able to make a habitat builder in the first 10 minutes of any run, but the increased costs here make even one hour a very tight deadline. Oh, and I can't stress enough how aggressive all of the hostile creatures are in this mode. No matter what I was doing, I basically had things trying to eat me at all times. Crashfish, biters, stalkers, and sand sharks would constantly come up from behind and get in a hit, taking off huge chunks of my health. 
I died a few times this way, incessantly checking the area for enemies, but still somehow taking a fatal bite in the back. When it was time for the aurora to blow, I swam down into Jelly Shroom Cave and sat by a pipe system I had set up down there. The ship exploded and I was given the blueprint for the radiation suit. I didn't have all the materials for the habitat builder yet, but at least I had a network of pipes lower than that 60 meters of radiation. Luckily the radiation doesn't go all the way down to 60 meters instantly. It spreads out over some amount of time, meaning I was still able to swim around 30 meters or so to collect supplies for a bit. After some more farming, I was able to craft the radiation suit. That dealt with the problem of constant damage, but didn't remove the other negative effects of radiation. Aside from the annoying fuzziness and camera darkening, power usage for anything in the radiation zone spiked up. Normally in the Death Run mod, using the fabricator takes about 15 power units. Inside the radiation zone, one use of the fabricator takes closer to 25 power units. Combined with the extremely slow power generation, you're really only able to fabricate things once every few minutes. Getting a functional base lower than the radiation zone was top priority, so it was back to more material hunting. After a few more run-ins with very angry crab snakes, I was finally able to craft a habitat builder. I grabbed up all my materials and headed over by the jelly shroom entrance to make my first base. I chose this spot because it was pretty close to my starting point, while also having easy access to a whole bunch of different biomes. Plus it was below the radiation zone, obviously. In order to have adequate power generation to offset the death run costs, I built a ton of solar panels. I really never could have enough, often fully draining my base's power despite covering every inch of the roof and panels. The solution was to just keep on building them, until I was comfortable with the power generation for a while. I spent the next couple of hours collecting resources, expanding my base, building out my system of air pipes, and scanning everything in sight. Due to the greatly increased blueprint costs, I was learning recipes very slowly, greatly delaying things I'd otherwise have early on. Things like the Sea Glide and Sea Moth, which would be easy to acquire within an hour or two, I still didn't have multiple hours into the game. I explored every inch of the nearby zones, scanning tons of fragments, and was still missing the blueprints for many key items. I did, however, make sure to build a bunch of medkit fabricators in my base. The constant bites from aggressive creatures often had me leaving the base with multiple medkits and coming back with none. I built a second base over in the central shallows, close to the original starting point in the regular game. My super complex network of pipes crisscrossed a whole bunch of zones, allowing worry-free travel between them. I eventually managed to scrounge up enough fragments and materials to craft a sea glide, a couple hours into the game. I probably could have done this faster, but I got distracted building out my pipe network for a while there. I find this extra funny because I've tried many times to use pipes in the regular game and always concluded that they were a complete waste of time. But change a few rules and suddenly they're quite useful. Funny how that works out. After building a few more bases around the map, I decided it was time to make progress on the story. I expanded my pipe system down into Jelly Shroom Cave and over towards the Degasi base. I got relentlessly attacked by piles of crab snakes and even died to the jellyfish once, as is customary. Despite those setbacks, I scanned everything in the base and was ready to continue on. I made good use of a bioreactor and a scanner room in the mushroom forest to hunt for nearby fragments. As I learned in my old No Vehicles run, even if I didn't want to use a Cyclops, I still had to make one at some point. The Neptune rocket requires a Cyclops shield generator module, which can only be crafted on board the Cyclops itself. I also managed to craft one of the Death Run exclusive recipes, basically an upgraded version of the compass equipment, which allows you to breathe surface air normally. At this point in the game it wasn't that helpful, but I'd get plenty of use out of it later on. With the Cyclops fully researched, I set off for the Underwater Islands wreck to do some more scanning. Before this point, I thought the aggressive fauna was overdone, but I hadn't seen anything yet. The bone sharks in this zone were so wildly aggressive, it was way beyond anything I had run into before this. If I stopped to open my inventory for longer than 3 seconds, I was basically guaranteed to take a bite. Scanning things was also troubling, requiring swimming in a circular pattern and hoping that they just barely miss. Needless to say, I used a whole bunch of medkits, but still died once or twice here. With my surface breathing equipment at hand, I decided to explore the aurora next. With the creature changes, this meant a run-in with the reaper was inevitable. Luckily I had the stasis rifle at the ready. Unluckily, the creature collision in this game is super wonky, so the shot phased right through its head. He was completely unbothered by it, but surprisingly didn't take my entire health with his bite. Instead of trying for a second shot, I made a quick escape onto the aurora. Inside, the radiation effects were doubled, making it incredibly hard to see just about anything. Thankfully I've done this part many times before so I knew what to do, Otherwise, this would have been impossible. Funny enough, the radiation effects don't apply when you pause the game. I paused every now and then when things got too hard to see, giving me a clear sight of my surroundings. I repaired the drive core, surprisingly only taking a handful of bites along the way. 
With the core repaired, the radiation effects were reduced to normal levels. This also had the bonus of removing the global radiation down to 60 meters. If I knew it did this too, I would have come to the Aurora much earlier. Regardless, I scanned everything in sight and made sure to grab the blueprint for the rocket. Next up was a quick trip to both islands. I scanned up everything on the floating island and collected a few tablets on the mountain island. Due to that super sight bonus for creatures, the reaper off the north side of Mountain Island somehow saw me on the south side. In its attempt to eat me alive, it somehow got stuck inside the island. Not actually in the caves or anything, just completely out of bounds. He continued to roar menacingly and clip the terrain, but ultimately I was safe. The next logical place to go was the Degasi base in the Deep Grand Reef. The Roarpers and Crab Squids weren't too happy I was there, but the Stasis Rifle actually decided to work for once. I grabbed the tablet and scanned all the useful stuff before heading off to prepare for the Great Descent. After considering the options, I decided to enter the Lost Server through the Blood Kelp Zone. The Ghost Leviathan didn't like me coming on his turf, but the Stasis Rifle saved the day again. From there, I built a series of bases through the Lost River by ferrying materials down from the surface. It took a couple trips, but I had a good network of pit stops from the Blood Kelp to the Lost River over to the Giant Cove Tree. I also explored the Disease Research Facility for some reason, even though I could have just skipped it altogether. On one of my trips down, I decided to scan a river prowler, thus discovering the blueprint for the next dive suit. Remember that diving depth limit I mentioned at the start of the video? Well, you can only go so far down depending on your current suit. The radiation suit lets you dive deeper, as does the reinforced dive suit, and two further upgrades for it. The first upgrade requires scanning and taking scales from river prowlers, and the second requires you to do the same, but with lava lizards. After upgrading the suit and building a few more bases, I set off for the lava castle. Both sea dragon leviathans in the inactive lava zone spotted me from a mile away and gave a pretty good chase. Luckily I made it inside before any of them got close enough to finish me off. I grabbed as much kyanite and sulfur as possible and swam into the alien thermal plant. Inside, I grabbed the blue tablet, learned the ion battery recipes, and opened up the portal back to the surface. With only one last place to explore, I stocked up on supplies and headed down to the primary containment facility. The sea dragon outside the building made a beeline for me, but the stasis rifle stopped him dead in his tracks. Seriously, the stasis rifle was the real star of this run. In all my other runs I would just keep my distance with the sea glide to avoid everything, but with death run's increased aggression, I would have been fish food many times over if not for my trusty rifle. Inside the facility, I opened up all the portals and collected everything I'd need for the hatching enzymes. I hopped into the aquarium and listened to the Sea Emperor Leviathan rattle off her speech about water, or whatever. Unluckily, I ended up having one too few ion cubes to open up everything in the facility. I couldn't open up the teleporter inside the aquarium, which also meant I couldn't get the hatching enzyme recipe. I had to head all the way back to the Lost River, grab the orange tablet, and open the cache near the Deep Grand Reef. After the long detour, I made my way back to the facility and opened the final teleporter. With the hatching enzyme recipe and materials at hand, I whipped up a batch and went back. I hatched the eggs and got cured of the disease by touching the funky jelly medicine. On my way back, I checked in at the big old gun building and got a clean bill of health. The gun shut down and I was cleared for takeoff. The last thing left to do was collect the remaining resources to build the Neptune rocket. It's always sort of anticlimactic finishing these runs with a long crafting section. I mean, if we really wanted to end on a high note, I could just quit after getting cured, like in my last run. Nevertheless, I finished building the rocket, packed up a few goodies, forgot to take a screenshot again, sent off the time capsule, strapped in, and blasted off into space. The death run was finally complete. 24 hours and 26 deaths. I could definitely go again for a better record, but that wasn't the goal of this video. I merely wanted to see how hard we could make Subnautica with the help of a few mods. I have to give huge props to Cattle Squat, the creator of Death Run, for making this whole wild ride possible. It really turns a normal run on its head, forcing you to play completely differently from just a few rule changes. It's a great way to experience Subnautica as you never have before. But I would definitely not recommend it unless you're very comfortable with the game. Even if you played Subnautica far too many times like me, you're still going to die over and over. It's a punishing experience, but I had a lot of fun with it. Do you think the death run makes for an interesting challenge? Maybe you'd tweak the settings a bit? Personally, I'd probably turn off the nitrogen bit, as it just felt like an annoyance after a while. Or maybe there's some other mod you wish existed for Subnautica. Let me know in the comments. What's next, you ask? Well, Below Zero officially releases on the 14th, so obviously I'll be playing that. Remember in my last video when I said, it was until Below Zero comes out. Here's to hoping it's not a long ways away. And then they literally announced it in the same week. 
I swear I don't have some insider info on this stuff. I might not immediately jump into a video on it, since this one took nearly a month to put together. I need a little break to work on the pile of other video ideas I have. But either way, I'll be super hard at work on the channel as usual. If you enjoy my stuff, subscribing always helps out a lot. We've gone from 1k to 10k subscribers since the new year alone, and it's been amazing to see the support. There's a lot more good content on the way. So until next time, have a good one, folks.